Here it is, this is the Redmi Book 14, a notebook that is quite powerful for the size of it, and it's got the same exact spec as the Mi Notebook Pro 2021 edition, and that is it's got the 11th gen chip in here with the 28 watts and the Iris XE graphics, 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and dual channel, and NVIDIA's MX450 dedicated GPU. This is the 25 watt version. As a 512 gigabyte NVMe drive, Thunderbolt 4 support, wireless 6, Bluetooth 5.1, a 56 watt hour battery, and a IPS screen with a resolution that is 2560 by 1600. It is 14 inches, and for a first for me in the channel that is, it has DC dimming this IPS screen. It does come well packaged up with this padding around it. We've got a very small Type-C charger here. This one is 65 watts to prong and a Type-C to Type-C cable. That's all we get. So we've got a good weight to this notebook here. It's only 1.46 kilos and approximately 16 millimeters, the thickness of it. So they've done an excellent job and it does have the CNC machining unibody for the palm rest, the keyboard, and even the lid. So build-wise, it's a step up from the previous models, definitely. So no huge branding on the lid, just the small Redmi, and that's what it says is power your creativity on there too. It's a little hard to see, it's very small, and I do like how sleek and really simplistic it does look. On the left for our ports, it is very good. This is better than the Mi Notebook Pro, their flagship notebook model, which only has Type-C ports. At least we do have the Type A and the full HDMI. So right here, status LED, this is for charging, 65 watt charger with this. So it takes somewhere close to about two hours to fully charge the 56 watt hour battery. And here is our USB 3.2 Gen 1. And then Thunderbolt 4 spec on this, really good to see. So yes, you can run external displays, 4K 60 tested and even an external Thunderbolt GPU if you wanted to do so. On the right, another USB port there, type A, and our 3.5 millimeter. So this supports microphones and very clean, nice sounding audio comes out of this one. No interference, no static, which is great to hear. So pressing on the lid, there is almost no flex at all there with it, which is good. And can it be opened one-handed? It can, as you can see, I'm able to open that right up. So a lot of people ask for this requirement. I don't know why, perhaps you've got a coffee in one hand and you wanna open it up. You can do it with this model. And that is the maximum that the lid will go back. The hinge does feel very good. It's not going to just drop down by itself. It feels stiff. And I do believe that is going to stand the test of time. This is now like the fifth generation of laptops from Xiaomi. So I do believe they've learned a few things from the first models in terms of build quality. So how is this keyboard? It is a good keyboard to type on, I really do like it. Now we've got a backlit keyboard, two stage, and straight away pushing the shortcuts, you don't have to push function. It's actually function to get F3. And this is the way that they've always done it, Xiaomi. So that's the first level, the second. And overall, it's really quite nice to type on. There's only a couple of minor complaints from me, and that is right here we have the AI button, and that's connected to the software. This is all in Chinese. Now if you uninstall it and remove it, then this button does nothing but it's where the delete key is. Fingerprint slash power button right here is very good. So using that to get into Windows Hello is a lot faster, of course. Same goes for the touchpad. This is a nice high quality touchpad, good smooth feeling to it, supports Windows 10 gestures. And I have noticed though, that when you click on it, so hardware left and right buttons are their hardware buttons. It does make a vibration, a vibrating rattle kind of noise. And when you type really heavily on this, at least my unit, it vibrates, and when you turn up the speakers really loud, the touchpad vibrates again. So I don't know whether that's a build quality issue, it's, that's just how it is, but I wish it did not have that rattle in the touchpad. Otherwise, it is a very good touchpad. Now the bias on this model, you can put it into English, which is good, it's just in the first menu under main, you scroll down and just under where it says the system date is where you can change that. Not a lot can be changed in here. There's only really one interesting setting and that is external keyboard mouse wake up. That's disabled by default. So if you need that, you have to go in and enable it. And that is basically it. Well, changing your boot order and secure boot. Nothing else of interest with the BIOS. And looking at our screen in detail. So this one's 14 inches. Now it is a 1600p screen and that means it's got the 16 by 10 aspect ratio. Now I have noticed 
that around the edges, it's not a uniformed color that it has. Blacks look decent on here. There's not much light leakage on the panel, and I'm currently measuring it now with my Spider Pro. And what it's told me too is the brightness is less than what they claim. So Xiaomi said it's a 300 nits display, but I am measuring only 260 nits with this one. That is with it plugged into the AC and also running on the battery. I just cannot get that 300 nits. So out of the box, it is quite uncalibrated uh, and it's got a very bluish tint to it, I did find. So right now is the calibrated view. If you've got a calibrated monitor screen looking at this, you'll probably pick, on, pick up on that blue tint that's clearly coming through, very bluish. And I get that a lot with IPS panels out of the box that they're not calibrated. They have not done a factory calibration on this screen at all with this one. So the coverage we've got with it, 98% sRGB, NTSC is 69%, Adobe RGB 75%. I mean, this is okay. This is definitely a step up from the Redmi Book 14, the previous model I reviewed, which had a terrible screen. It's just, I wish the screen brightness was over 300 nits and not 260. We get 76% P32, if you're interested in that. The Redmi Book 14 screen does have DC dimming, and what this means and translates into is no flicker. So even down at the lowest brightness setting, which is only about 10 nits, which is very good, nice and dim, great for late night use, no flicker, none whatsoever. Now, normally this would be coming through it on camera. It would be flickering away like crazy if it didn't have the DC dimming, and there at its 260 nits maximum brightness, you certainly will not see any flicker there either. So that's good that they have given that this option, I wanna see more manufacturers. In fact, it should be standard now in 2021, DC dimming on all screens. Underside of the notebook now, so we have T5 Torx screws that are located all around the outside that you do need to remove if you wanna gain access to the internals, that is. Good news is there's no more hidden Torx screw under the rear rubber foot. They used to hide two of them under here, no longer the case. So this design is very, very similar to say the Mi Notebook Air that I reviewed years ago in their Mi Notebook lineup. So we have the two downward firing speakers right here. This is the intake vent, so important to never block this. All made out of this brush alloy finish, that gray, just like the lid and everything else. And the top part of it, the frame with the keyboard and everything, that's just one piece. So that's a unibody, well, just the one piece cut from CNC machine process that they do use. I'll show you the internals now. Now I'll give you a bit of information on the thermals later in this particular video here, but this is a concern of mine. The two heat pipes, that's fine. It's just the single fan. Really, they should have gone with the second fan, I think, and separate both GPU and the chipset. They're connected to the both of them. So if you're not using the GPU, this provides really good cooling, of course, and this is a very large fan. The fan noise so far has been excellent, very, very good. You barely even hear it when it's on the lowest setting. When it cranks up to the highest, it's barely noticeable. Well, you do notice it, but it's not that offensive. So under the shielding right here, we do have our RAM soldered onto the motherboard. This under here is the AX201 wireless card, so you can change that if you wanted to do so. You could put maybe a Realtek in there, and if you wanted to do some sort of Hackintosh build, you could do that with this. And under the shielding here, this is our NVMe drive. Now, compared to the earlier models, you do notice the difference with the inner frame. This is much thicker, more sturdy, less flex, more durable. They've crammed a lot in here. The layout is good. And all the screws have been torqued up correctly. I have not found any of the screws to be loose. The hinge around here, this is all made out of metal. Their motherboard is screwed in to the bottom of this, which is the top, the palm rest, and that is all metal there as well. So the layout is great. The internals, it's just like any other top class, high-end premium laptop. So really there are no upgrades at all with this particular laptop. So if you do need to have the higher RAM, then well, they all come with the 16 base, which is very, very good. But if you need the higher storage capacity, then go for the higher models, I'd say, if you don't wanna to have to open it up. Now, if you end up getting into trouble with the BIOS, if you somehow brick this and you may have a fix to remove the battery right here, that is the BIOS battery, which is located under the SSD, I don't think that's a brilliant location considering the heat that SSDs can generate. A lot of that is going to be passed then to that battery. And you'll see on the inside of the lid, there is no thermal pad to transfer heat from the SSD onto the back here to create like a, a heat sink for it, a big, like, huge heat sink. So that's one area that I wish that this wasn't like this. I think it should be in a different place, but then they don't have room to put it anywhere else, do they? So up the top, we do have a webcam. This one is VGA, so 720p only resolution, flanked by two dual array microphones. 
So it does have a little bit of grain to it, and I've got some bright studio lights on, and that is definitely going to help this image quality. So if you're in a dimly lit environment, don't expect this to be amazing. In fact, most laptops, I would say a good 95%, have terrible webcams, and I would not rate this as amazing, but it's certainly better than some of them I've seen out there. So as I mentioned there in the start, this is the Core i7 model. It's the maximum spec model that you can get. And these internals are the same as the Intel version of the Mi Notebook Pro. So we've got four cores, eight threads, maximum turbo is 4.7. This is the Tiger Lake U and it is 28 watts. That's our TDP. And this, of course, is 10 nanometers. Finally, yay, hooray, give someone, someone give Intel a medal for this. They've finally moved away from 14 nanometers. Even though that, yes, AMD's on 7 nanometer process, Intel's having a lot of trouble. If you know all that history, I won't go into all of that. So our memory, I have confirmed that the memory that is running at 3,200 megahertz, it's dual channel, the two chips on this, and it's part of the motherboard. So no RAM upgrades with this one at all, unfortunately. And the good news with the chip here that is the dedicated graphics, the MX450, that this is the 25 watt version. Now there's a completely gimped version, uh, which only is 10 watts, and it offers pretty much not really that much better performance than even the integrated graphics. So you check the boost clock if it's 1575, and even the device ID, I can confirm it's the 25 watt version. There is a 28 watt version, which is marginally better and that I think there's another version too as well with DDR6 RAM, but this only has the DDR5. These are Micron chips, two gigabytes of dedicated RAM. Overall, this performance is going to be around somewhere of the GTX 1650, like a Max Q version, slightly less, slightly under that. So it's okay for gaming, and I'll get onto that probably in the full review or we'll post a separate video on gaming performance. Performance-wise, let's have a look at a few figures here that I did run. So here is Cinebench R20. It's okay, considering it's a quad core there, that's not too bad performance. Now, you can probably undervolt this. I haven't tested out Windows Extreme Tuning Utility or Throttle Stop or anything like that, but undervolting, I think, is supported, and you should be able to gain a bit in performance there, just holding higher clocks uh, with that. And Geekbench 4, 5, sorry. This is the Geekbench 5 score, so that's actually quite good. That single core score, very impressive for that, because it does turbo up to close to... 5 gigahertz, 4.7, not bad. And multi-core score here with the four cores, the eight threads, again, is not too bad there for that. So what about the OpenCL score? This is testing out the dedicated graphics here. So this first was the MX450, so 28,000 points, more or less. And if you did go with the, just force the integrated graphics, which is that Intel XE, the Iris XE, about half the performance there. This is just roughly, okay? So half the performance. So that's why it is good to get this model with the dedicated GPU versus just the Intel base one, which is about 200 US cheaper, but really not worth it. So internal storage, our speeds of that one I have benchmarked. Now I checked with HW Info, just like I confirmed the RAM's dual channel. This apparently is a PCIe four drive, although the speeds aren't really PCIe 4. I expected them to be a little bit better, but still very, very good with the random reads there. It's not bad. So it is a fast drive, 512 gigabytes, and they have partitioned it like this Xiaomi. So 146 on one partition and then 329 on the other. Of course, when I did get it, Windows 10 is Windows 10 home Chinese single language version. So I upgraded to Windows 10 Pro from a key that I do happen to own. I've got a few keys and then I just simply installed the English language pack, okay? So that worked fine and there's a few things that are still showing up in Chinese. I probably need to do a factory reset to completely get everything to pull over. Included bloatware with this model. So there is some wallpaper thing from Xiaomi. You can uninstall that. There's some MIUI sync program. Uh, you need to really understand Chinese to be able to take advantage of that. And there was a firmware update that was pulled through from Windows 10 update system. Okay, and that is a firmware update. Don't know what exactly it fixes, but good to see this, that they are pushing those out. And what about thermals? This is uh, already initially some bad news here with the thermals. Fan noise has been very good, very tame. 
Oh, you can see here that I just confirmed as well that it's pulling about 25 watts, the GPU, that MX, NVIDIA MX450. So yes, it's the good version. But here's the bad news. It reaches 100 degrees Celsius, that 1165G7 from Intel. So it's a hot running chip. And yeah, the cooling, I don't know if it's up to performance. Well, it's not really up to spec there, is it? If it's hitting 100 degrees Celsius, triggering thermal throttling, uh, that's not a good sign to see. So when gaming and taxing both of them out, which is when I was just doing some benchmarks, that's when we hit that 100 degrees. And then the speakers, as I showed you when I did the tear down, that they are downwards firing either side here. So you can easily block them off if you were to place this on your lap and use it as an actual lap top, as the name suggests, or you put it on a bed. DTS tuned audio to with this, and they sound very good. It's just as I mentioned before that I think it's the touchpad that rattles at 100% volume. And here they are now at 100% volume, so you can get an idea of what they sound like. They're not bad speakers, but I've certainly heard better. Okay, before I get onto the gaming performance of that NVIDIA MX450, I know I'm keen to see how it performs. There's just a couple of things I wanted to point out. That the system overall, I'm not going to show any basic document use and things like that, that I normally cover in my reviews because it is very, very fast, smooth, and fluid. The same goes for video playback. So this is 4K60 demanding file. Now this is not an HDR panel, but you can still play HDR footage and put that through to an HDR capable TV monitor, whatever. Uh, jellyfish file so this one's 4k 100 megabits per second again pretty much flawless there so it handles everything with ease it's a very fast system overall windows in and out document spreadsheets so when i get onto the gaming performance which is up next this is what i will do i will run high performance nvidia processor just make sure it's not swapping over to the xe graphics the iris xe will keep it on that for the entirety of this video and i have selected here maximum performance this can give it a bit of a boost because it's on the optimal power i think by default but this will hopefully give us the absolute best and while this is not a game it is a gaming benchmark and fire strike i'll just run this and let you know what you can expect but you can see there at the top frames per second and we're already getting up to when gaming around about 75 degrees here are the results here. So the graphics score 4,669 is not amazing. So it is a very low end GPU. Remember, it only has the two gigabytes of RAM. So strictly 1080p only. If you wanted to game at 1440p or 4K on an external monitor, this GPU will choke. It does not have the memory or the memory bandwidth for that. So disappointing kind of performance. But for me, not really, because this is not a gaming laptop. This is a business laptop with a dedicated weaker low-end GPU. Cyberpunk, a very demanding game and still quite a mess even after the big patch 1.2 I think it was. I've got it set to 720p on the lowest possible settings and let's see what the MX450 can do. So low right there and I've got no frame cap or anything like that and this well this resolution is basically 720p there. Semi, semi playable. It's down to 20 frames per second. Nah that's that's not good. That's not good at all. And this is the lower settings. Okay, so I could tweak down the traffic a little bit and a few of those things there to do with the population density and whatnot to improve performance. It's struggling. And look at that, 100 degrees. We are running into thermal throttling constantly with this laptop. Wow, that's hot. Far Cry 5, I've got this on the lowest settings. This is set to 1080p and we're looking around mid 30s frames per second up to high 30s, which is okay, I guess, considering that this is not a potent GPU. It is very much low-end entry level stuff. So if you want better gaming performance than this, you are going to need to look at an RTX 3060 or 3070 laptop, of course. And forget about PC hardware right now. Buying a GPU, they're just no stock or really expensive. The Witcher 3, Again, 1080p, and again, lowest settings here, 50 frames per second. This is looking good. This is all right. I could game like this quite happily on a laptop like this. So that's not bad. It all depends on the game. So other games, of course, things like Fortnite, Counter-Strike, they are going to run well on this kind of chip on the MX 
450. Games that are lighter, not so demanding, will be fine. But I just wanted to show you these more demanding games. And it's just to give you an idea what you can expect gaming out of the Redmi Book 14. Video editing now. This is with Adobe Premiere Pro. And it's not bad. Okay, the dedicated GPU is helping a lot. It feels a lot quicker than the MateBook X Pro that I have from Huawei. That particular model does have the same chipset, but it doesn't have the dedicated GPU. And clearly with the timeline scrubbing head and things, it feels a lot quicker. So export time now, I will check that. We'll do one minute of footage at the YouTube preset. Ouch. So two minutes in, say 58 seconds for one minute of footage at the preset, the YouTube 4K export preset. Not a good result at all. I expected so much better. 30 minutes of gaming of Cyberpunk and look at how hot this thing is getting. So 51 degrees, I'm seeing it peak at around here at the top. The keyboard is getting quite warm, a little uncomfortable, and it's just above the keyboard. That's going to hit about 53 degrees right here. It feels very hot to the touch. And I do have it propped up on a keyboard to help the airflow. So really, the thermals, the cooling solution that Xiaomi's gone with on this, I don't think it's good enough. They should have gone with two different separate thermal transfer pipes and two coolers, not just the one cooler sharing the GPU and the CPU. Clearly, it's not enough. And onto our battery life too, which is very important. So I've run this through a couple of my tests and my general kind of workload, which is mixed Chrome, a bit of YouTube, streaming, all sorts of things. And you're looking at around six to six and a half hours with the brightness at 30% using just the integrated graphics. As soon as you swap over to the MX450, the power demand really does increase and our battery life drops off completely, bringing it down then to about two and a half hours on the dedicated graphics, which is not a lot. Now charge time is excellent. It's about one hour and 45 to 50 minutes. Very, very quick at the beginning. It slows right down near the end. So the first 50% will only take around about 38 minutes in my testing, which is really quick, even though it's 65 watts. The other models do offer 100 watt charging. It's not too bad there. So the build quality, excellent. I really do like the keyboard, backlit, very nice to type on. Trackpad is really good too, but it does have a bit of an issue. Well, my unit is, is there's a, a rattle noise coming through and a vibration from the touchpad or the speakers somewhere when you have the volume quite loud. Now the webcam performance as I showed you is not amazing. It does look a little bit grainy. The screen, it's not a bad panel. I love the fact it has DC dimming. So this screen, it does not show any flickers. I'll lock right down for you to show you again. It doesn't flicker. Now if this didn't have the DC dimming, this would be shimmering away, especially on camera. And some people are very, very prone to that. So no issues there. However, the brightness, it's 260 nits, which is fine for indoor use, anti-glare coating on it, but I really wish it was the advertised 300 nits. I tested with two light meters, one of them my Spider Pro, Spider 5 Pro, and it's the same. 260 nits is all we're getting out of this. So it's good to see we haven't got single channel RAM, it's dual channel RAM here, the 16 gigabytes, can't upgrade it, sadly. But then it comes to the big con, the big downfall of this laptop for me is the thermals. So they went with only one large fan and the two thermal transfer copper transfer pipes there. And they're connected to the GPU. So the GPU and the CPU are on the same pipe, the two pipes, and they're affecting one another. That to me is a bit of a mistake. They should have separated them. They should have had two fans in there. So it hits 100 degrees Celsius. When you're pushing it hard, doing anything like video editing and gaming, it will get extremely hot because the CPU will then start to affect and gradually get that GPU a lot hotter. The GPU clocks start to drop right down and performance is clearly affected. Thermal throttling takes place. So if you wanted the best performance out of this hardware, sadly, this design, the thermal design in this one and being 14 inches is simply not enough to cool down those two powerful components that are in this. So they've made a blunder with the thermals and the design, I believe, in this one. So it is a good laptop, but you really need to factor that in. And okay, this does sell for about 1100 US dollars. I bought this one here from Banggood. It's an expensive laptop. Compare and have a look around at what you've got locally. May have to pay a little bit more, but remember when you import this in that it's gonna be in Chinese, you need to correct that, get Windows in English. 
and there's just a lot going for it and there's a lot not really going for this. So I'm not too sure whether I'm going to review the Xiaomi Mi Notebook Pro. That's, I know a lot of people wanna see it. It's got the OLED screen and it has the DC dimming, very good color coverage on that screen. Same exact internals, but it has the two fans in it. I believe thermals will be a lot better in that model. I may review it, but currently the dealers in China want 1400 US dollars for the base model. That's crazy expensive. Then I got 21% tax on top and all those sort of issues there with a video that maybe no one's really that interested in. So I'm not too sure I'll cover that one. But thank you so much for watching my review here of the Redmi Book 14. Sadly, it's a little hard to recommend this one due to those thermals, which I don't think any firmware updates are going to fix unless they really throttle down that CPU.